Uh, hello, this is Johnny Rains, and I'm here to talk through one of the classics of fantastique cinema, Carl Theodor Dreyer's Vampire, uh, shot in 1930-31 and premiered in Berlin on the 6th of May, 1932. And the premiere had been somewhat delayed by the German distributor Ufa, um, allegedly because they wanted the uh, Universal films, uh, Hollywood productions, Dracula and Frankenstein, to be released first. And Dreyer felt uh, rather embittered as he felt that his market had been somewhat damaged by the release of the American films first. Uh, in any case, the film was, was apparently finished. The, the post uh, the post production of the film was finished in the summer of 1931, so it sat on the shelf for something like nine months before the Berlin premiere. The Berlin premiere was a little stormy. Uh, there was, uh, how to say, mixed reactions in the theatre. And uh, as a result of the reaction, Dreyer cut the film, it's known, slightly. Some scenes were taken out and it was reduced to its present running time of about 70, 70 odd minutes. Um, in addition, the situation was complicated by the way the film was made. Like many early talkies, there were three different versions and the, the leading actors with speaking roles were chosen for their ability to speak three languages, or at least mouth three languages. So although the film was shot without direct sound, uh, the actors were required to perform each scene with dialogue three times in three different languages, and all three were post-synchronized in Berlin after the shoot. The only ones who spoke their own voices, as it were, were the lead actor who calls himself Julian West, uh, though his real name is a little different, as we'll come to in a bit, and the actress Sibylla Schmitz, who plays the elder sister. Julian West is in fact the pseudonym of Nicholas de Gunsberg, a minor European aristocrat, usually credited as being Dutch, but uh, by his own account, he had a Russian father and a Polish-Brazilian mother. Uh, in any case, he was a, a minor aristocrat of uh, uh, the European type, um, based in Paris, and he agreed to finance the production of this film on the one condition that he acted in it himself. It was his first and last time to be an actor, as far as I know. Um, he was otherwise primarily a fashion journalist, working for such magazines as uh, Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, um, and he's not really an actor, although I think Dreyer makes very astute use of his blankness in this role. Uh, this was Dreyer's first film for five years. His, his previous one was uh, The Passion of Joan of Arc, made also in France in 1927, and he'd spent much of the intervening five years in litigation with his French producers' distributors, uh, a company called Société Générale du Cinéma. Um, that case had finally gone his way, and I gather that Société Générale obviously forgave him because they distributed Vampire in France. Um, but it, anyway, this had impeded Dreyer from making more films, and, and it was the first extended gap in his, in his career, in fact. It turned out to be far from the last, because it was uh, more than 10 years before he was able to make his next feature after this, and then there were gaps of 10 or 11 years between his subsequent films again until his death. In other words, not a prolific director. This was his first talkie, uh, but he's responded to the demands of sound, uh, sound cinema by keeping dialogue to an absolute minimum. And I would say that the aesthetic of the film is still predominantly a silent aesthetic. Um, what Dry is doing here, I think, is, is quite complicated and we'll come to more specific discussion of what's happening with the camera work, the montages, the cutting, the um, eccentric construction of some of these shots and sequences. Uh, a bit later on, but uh, let's say for now that, that the film is mostly to do with visual expressiveness and relies very little on its dialogue to construct meaning and to construct drama. Now, you'll have noticed in the credits that there's an acknowledgement of a derivation from a book by Sheridan Le Fanu, the Irish writer. Some people say Le Fanu, and some people say Le Fanu. I don't know which is right. Um, it's a book called uh, In a Glass Darkly, and it's actually a collection of five short stories, 
all of them with supernatural themes. Uh, and Dreyer has drawn on at least two of them for this film. One is Carmilla, which is basically a, um, a lesbian vampire story. The other is a, um, a story called uh, The Room in the Dragon Volant, in which the young protagonist, rather like this man, Alan Gray, imagines himself uh, buried alive and carried along in a coffin. Uh, which is something that is going to happen to this man later in the film, as you probably know if you've seen it already. Now, um, there's no direct adaptation here. There's no, there's no sense that, that the, the film derives from Sheridan Le Fanu. It's simply a matter of genre, I think. And it is a fact that uh, although... Uh, well, the, Dreyer wanted, I think, to make a genre film at this point. Uh, some accounts of him at this period uh, quote him as saying, oh, I can do one of those, uh, because there was a fashion for this kind of film at the time. Um, whether that's true or not, we'll never be sure, I guess, but uh, it is clear that this is a very different kind of film from The Passion of Joan of Arc, which was a, a, a frankly non-generic film, a film that was very much sui generis, as. Uh, the Latins would say, a uh, film uh, one of a kind, well, uh, a film that defined its own rules and made its own tone and structure. This actually is a film that also defines its own tone and makes its own structure, but in a very different way, and it does so on the base of a genre, which it's either uh, participating in or reacting against, according to taste. Um, now, perhaps the first thing to say about the style of the film is uh, that... It's full of disjunctions. It's full of uh, unorthodox editing, unorthodox framing, and unorthodox cutting, and that none of it fits together in the way that one has learned to expect classical storytelling in film to do. So that uh, the shots don't seem to match each other, and there's, there are constant dislocations in one's sense of the space and... Uh, what's where and where things are in relationship to each other. It's impossible to construct a, a mental image of uh, how the different sections fit together. You wouldn't find your way from A to B if you were in this in yourself based on the information given by the film uh, about A and about B. Um, I think that has quite a lot to do with the question of subjectivity, which in my view is the key to this film. Uh, the film is, uh, I think, centrally about subjectivity, and the opening captions, which have introduced Alan Gray as a dreamer, a fantasist, a man obsessed with uh, occult law and uh, vampire law and such like, who has wandered into this village uh, in, uh, unsure of where he's going and simply looked for a, a lodging for the night. Well, the implication is that, that this man is somehow inviting these adventures. His mind is open to this kind of experience and that maybe all of this should be seen as a projection of his repressed or barely repressed desires to find the fantastic wherever he goes. Uh, and the film certainly invites that kind of a reading. Uh, the early scenes of the film are uh, increasingly enigmatic, especially with this visitor who may or may not be a spectre who finds his way into the room in the middle of the night, doesn't introduce himself, talks about a woman dying and how she mustn't be allowed to die, uh, and leaves an enigmatic package with saying to be opened only in the event of my death. Uh, all of this is, is pulp fiction stuff, uh, which Dreyer has come up with, uh, clearly aware of its generic roots, but he's made it rather extraordinary by anchoring it in these ambiguities about uh, Alan Gray's consciousness. Are all these things projections of his fantasy, or are these things really happening? In other words, whose consciousness is in play here? Is this his consciousness, and are we seeing things entirely from his point of view, at least his mental point of view, if not his, if not his uh, eyeball point of view? Uh, or are we seeing things in a somewhat more objective fashion, and either way, how does the expressionism of the images relate to that? Um, if it's a more objective point of view, why is it expressionist in the way that it is? Why is it so mist-shrouded? And how does that in turn relate to the discontinuities, the ambiguities? Uh, we could go further. How does it relate to the illusions, the fact that we don't see little conventional linking material that uh, we might expect to find, like uh, his conversation about having a room for the night, his conversation about how much it might cost? All that's not there. 
Uh, it might also relate to the cutaways, the strange shots, for example, of the Reaper uh, taking the ferry across the river as Alan Gray arrives at the inn. And when he moves into his room and looks out of the window, he sees the man, but he sees him from the other side. The man is, is being ferried across the river away from the inn. But uh, for some reason, when Alan Gray looks out and sees him, he sees his face. Uh, that seems to imply that what we're seeing is a mental image rather than uh, a physical image, rather than what he's, you know, a, a faithful reproduction of his point of view. How does equally, how does it relate to the prowling camera, the strange uh, camera movements, the, the urgency of them, the, the way that the camera moves towards the characters in great speed very often? Uh, how does it relate to the sense of off-screen space, that strange, uh, the, the moment he checked into the room, the noise is off, the strange sounds of an argument or some kind of distress, followed by that uh, unnerving glimpse of apparently a blind man coming down the stairs. Um, all of which, I mean, adds up to a very um, comprehensive barrage of attacks on the audience. And as I, I suspect also goes quite a long way towards explaining why the initial premiere audience in Berlin had difficulty knowing what to make of this film. The film so comprehensively breaks most of the conventional rules of storytelling by this point that uh, I think many audiences, especially when they come to it for the first time, and especially if they come to it unprepared, not knowing who is Carl Dreyer or what his ambitions for the film might be, uh, would be pretty baffled. And certainly by this point, with uh, reverse motion of, uh, you know, this is not a grave digger, but a grave undigger. Um, uh, and this is not the last time that we will see this shadow. Uh, he turns out to be the first of a whole, or not the first, the second of a whole series of shadows. We've already seen Peg Leg here, the, the, the musketeer with uh, one wooden leg, uh, walking along the side of a canal. Um, but it was only his shadow reflected in the water that we saw. There seemed to be no physical reality to him. We now discover why that is, since the shadow is rejoining the physical body uh, in the upcoming sequence. Um, but that turns out to be, he turns out to be the harbinger of an entire shadow world, which is uh, what we're about to explore. Once again, there's a clear implication that much of this is uh, Alan Gray's projection, that there is a sense that, that uh, Alan Gray is seeing these things or fantasizing or dreaming these things because that's what he's looking for. His is a mind that is open to this kind of mystification, this kind of bafflement. Uh, and uh, we can't be sure at this point whether any of this has any kind of objective reality to it. These sequences, incidentally, were shot in apparently a, a disused factory where, uh, where Dreyer had whitewashed the walls for this kind of effect, uh, apparently an ice factory originally. Uh, and it was in the village or near the village of Courtempierre, the village named in the, uh, the film's own fiction. Uh, it kept its real name. Uh, Dreyer was attracted to this place. It's a village somewhat north of Paris, apparently, uh, because he liked the chateau, a rather run-down uh, building, which, uh, but on a quite grand scale, uh, which became one of the major locations for the film. It's where the father and his two daughters live with some servants. And uh, it, it became apparently also the, the lodging place for the cast and crew during the production while they were there. Well, this, I, this uh, former ice factory was somewhere nearby and uh, apparently a minimum of uh, set dressing was required to, to make it suitable for the film. It's one of a series of found locations. I think the budget wouldn't have run to actually building any sets for this film. But uh, thanks to the resourcefulness of Dreyer and his designers, and particularly the cinematographer Rudolf Matte, uh, whom Dreyer had met in Berlin some years earlier and who he'd worked with already on, on uh, Passion of Joan of Arc, uh, the results, well, I won't say they looked like a million dollars, but they certainly don't look like uh, uh, a low-budget quickie. Uh, the film is full of very ambitious effects, like this extended tracking shot which I think had a disguised edit in it, but uh, uh, shots repeatedly combine different spaces, different perspectives, uh, and uh, different effects. Some of the, all of them, I think, or pretty much all of them done in camera.
it may be worth pointing out at this point that, that uh, there was a fashion briefly in Paris at this time for uh, independently financed artistic feature films. Uh, this film came hard on the heels of uh, Jean Cocteau's first film, Le Sang d'un Poet, The Blood of a Poet, and uh, the film made by Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali called The Golden Age, L'Age d'Or, um, both of which were financed by the Vicomte de Noailles, um, uh, again, a minor French aristocrat at the time who was wealthy and who had an interest in film. Uh, Nicolas de Gunsberg apparently was a similar figure, although perhaps not as wealthy as the Vicomte. Um, it was a brief flowering of, of what you might call artistic patronage in filmmaking. Uh, Dreyer had had more than his share of troubles with film companies, and he would have a great many more over the last uh, three decades of his life, his active filmmaking life. Um, but uh, he, so he fell uh, perhaps very gratefully upon the sponsorship of, of Mr. de Gunsberg and was happy to accept him. His, his one condition that he be the lead actor in the film himself. Now let's return to the style of the film. Um, the sequence after sequence in this movie cries out for, you know, shot by shot analysis, actually. It's, it's very interesting to take the thing apart and look at the way that the effects in the film are constructed. And it's uh, particularly rewarding because the shots are so discontinuous, because there's uh, no uh, conventional editing suturing. The audience is not uh, uh, implicated into the spaces in the film. You're not invited to mentally reconstruct the, the reality of the scene uh, because of the way that it's shot and the way it's put together. And I think Dreyer has deliberately uh, created it in such a way that, that it's meant to be extremely disconcerting. Uh, for example, this shot uh, of a hand on the banister uh, introducing a character for the first time, uh, the doctor, who turns out to be one of the key figures in the film, um, is not from Alan Gray's point of view. It cannot be. Uh, and frequently where you think that a shot might be subjective, uh, you find that the person who is allegedly doing the looking is included in the shot and therefore cannot be obviously seeing it from his point of view. Um, in regard to this, I think it's interesting to quote a little bit from something that Dreyer said in a magazine article in Denmark in 1933, a year after the premiere of this film. Um, forgive me, I'll quote. All good films, he writes, are characterized by a certain rhythmic tension, which is induced partly by the character's movements, as revealed in images, and partly by the tempo, rapid or less rapid, at which these images succeed one another. For the first kind of tension, much importance is attached to the lively use of a moving camera, which even in close shots adroitly follows the characters, so that the background constantly shifts as it does when we follow somebody with our eyes. As for the succession of images, it's of some significance for the adaptation of stage plays, that in each act of most plays, there is as much action off stage as on, which can yield material for new elements and consequently for new rhythms. Now, this film is not, of course, based on a stage play. It's an original script. But uh, it, it uh, does make very extensive play with uh, off-screen space, and in particular, off-screen sound. So the mysterious sounds that we keep hearing, uh, very often like animal cries, uh, and as I've already noted, apparently constructed by uh, animal mimics specialists in the business who stood by in the post-synchronization studio in Berlin to make them. Um, these add up to a way of problematizing and, and uh, rendering indistinct and uncertain the off-screen spaces of the film. Um, now, for the first time here, I think the importance of this scene is, is it's the first time really that we get a good look at the vampire herself, Marguerite Chopin, uh, and her acolyte, the doctor, who seems to be also a vampire, judging by the coffin that we found upstairs in his premises a few moments ago. Um, or in any case, he's certainly uh, in her thrall in more ways than one. Uh, and the fact that they're being watched by a, a, a partly animated skull um, lends a certain importance to these scenes because these are the first scenes in the entire film to date not uh, witnessed by Alan Gray. 
Everything we've seen so far has been, if not through his eyes, then filtered through his consciousness and arguably uh, explicable as somehow a reflection of his consciousness or an expression of his, his repressed desires. That cannot be said of these scenes because he's not there. He's outside in the countryside. Uh, he's back with the uh, grave undigger and uh, the world of shadows, and he's following people around and uh, exploring the region. Uh, of course, he could be dreaming the whole thing, but if he is dreaming, then uh, uh, it makes no sense that he's having dreams about characters who he hasn't really met and doesn't really know anything about. Um, maybe this is the moment to just draw attention to the title backgrounds. Uh, this is the fourth and last of the film's major captions. Their, their, their function is taken up later in the film by pages from a book of vampire lore. Um, but the titles have been used to uh, clarify story background and, and introduce characters and uh, introduce themes. And each of them has had a, a faded up behind it a little image. Uh, the first one was a spider's web at the beginning of the film. The second one was uh, a cr an, uh, an hourglass. The third one was a cross. The fourth one, I'm not sure what it was. I think it, it looks like the view through a skylight, very possibly of the angel atop the, the inn in Courtempierre. But uh, anyway, an ambiguous image. But these images are clearly designed to somehow underline the sense that, uh, for example, Alan Gray might be uh, walking into... Uh, a trap, in the sense that the spider's web connotes a trap, and he's the unwary fly who is uh, getting himself embroiled and enmeshed in this in a way that makes it inextric inextricable. The hourglass implies urgency, the time factor um, comes after the, the master of the chateau, the man we're now seeing looking after his, his ailing daughter, um, is talking about death and, and uh, both his own potential death and his daughter's impending death. Uh, the cross implies a certain kind of religious salvation element, which uh, certainly chimes with the, the uh, conventional view of Dreyer as a, as a stern Puritan moralist uh, from the Protestant uh, Nordic Church. But uh, I think uh, it may be a little bit more ambiguous than that, and as well, and we'll come to the avoidance of religiosity in this film when we come closer to the end. Um, and the fourth one is, is to do, I think, with shadow play, and that's what we see reaching its climax here and now with the apparent assassination of the master of the chateau, the father of the two, the two daughters. Um, this is a shadow that's apparently shooting him um, and uh, causing a fatal injury, um, and an accident that happens to be witnessed again by Alan Gray, which brings us back into the, the realm of, of subjectivity and uh, uh, potential personal fantasy. Now, um, by this point, uh, I think Dreyer has pretty successfully completely undermined the notion that this needs to be seen either as a subjective dream or as an objective, uh, fantastic, fantastic reality. Uh, it is inescapably both together. Um, Dreyer is not a stupid man, and he knows that it's impossible for shadows to shoot people, and uh, particularly not to shoot them fatally, um, and that whatever has happened to this man, uh, although we saw it, or Alan Gray thought he saw it, as uh, him being shot by a peg-legged musketeer, um, could be interpreted as, as the man having, for example, a sudden heart attack or a sudden stroke. Maybe this is what, he's, what has caused his sudden demise. He, has, he is, after all, a man who's been under considerable stress. Um, and uh, the fear is that spoonfuls of, of tea from a, a probably rather cold cup of tea uh, are not going to be enough to revive him, as indeed it turns out they're not. Um, what I'd like to draw attention to here, now that we've uh, uh, tried to suggest the way that Dreyer has broadened out the issue from uh, um, the question of purely uh, Alan Gray's subjectivity into a broader picture of a more fantastic reality, um, 
is the way that he is constantly cross-cutting and constantly, as he adds more characters to the, to the fiction, um, dividing our interest between the reactions of different people. Uh, this is a film made rather like Joan of Arc in this one respect, of many, many short shots. Um, and there's also, perhaps not quite as much as in Joan of Arc, uh, an emphasis on close-ups of faces. Uh, Joan of Arc, however, was a very pure film, a film in which every face was pin sharp and carefully chosen, every detail was carefully chosen, every prop was carefully chosen, and much of, much of, the, much of these things was, were, were displayed against white or blank backgrounds to highlight their purity and to focus attention on them undividedly. Vampire, by contrast, is a, a very cluttered film. It has a lot of things going on. Uh, it is very much designed. Uh, all the background details count, from the, the the print that was on the wall of Alan Gray's hotel room to the uh, tapestries and paintings that hang in this house, the chateau, uh, to the way the characters dress, the way uh, the carpet in the background of this shot, for example. Um, all of these are... are design features which, which clutter the frame and, and prevent a, a single-minded focus on any one detail. Um, and that plenitude of imagery is very much matched by the editing structures of the film, which are plural. We've already noted the propensity for cutaways in this movie. The, uh, from the very first scene onwards, those, those strange, anomalous, unassimilable cutaways to the, the reaper who is waiting, who pauses to ring the bell on the bank of the river and then uh, takes the ferry when it comes, and presumably in response to his, his call on the bell. Um, uh, the fact that, that the, the shots of the reaper had nothing at all to do with Alan Gray and his arrival, except insofar as Gray might fantasize something about him uh, by happening, happening to glimpse him. Um, set a pattern for the rest of the film. So the film has proceeded through cutaways. Uh, the, the grave undiggers, for example, are cutaways who function like that. Now that we're into more of a narrative flow in the film, uh, although there's still a lot of disjunction from one shot to the next, the, the shots don't match in the careful, smooth, seamless way that one is used to in Hollywood films of the period. Uh, and that's very much clearly uh, Dreyer's intention. Um, but we are into more sustained dramatic scenes here with more characters on the screen and more characters involved. Uh, and here the function of cutaways is taken up by the sheer density of cutting. Um, Matei's, Rudolf Matei's camera work has also calmed down a little bit now. We don't have those urgent tracks forward, which have no meaning in and of themselves, but contribute overall to the sense of urgency and, and menace and uncertainty which dominate the early scenes of the film. Now a more tragic mood is taking over, partly because one of the characters has died, as he apparently foresaw that he might uh, when he left the package in, in Alan Gray's room. Um, but also because um, uh, we're settling into a more conventional uh, dramatic reality in, in that characters are beginning to meet each other, relate to each other. Interestingly, though, this is still not dialogue-based. Uh, we've already noted that, that uh, Dreyer's avoidance of dialogue as much as possible is related to the need to shoot in three different languages. And because of the complications of that, he obviously wanted to keep dialogue to a minimum, and much of the dialogue that is spoken is not spoken in frame, or not with the character's face visible at the time of, of, of speaking, uh, which makes it obviously easier to, to post-synchronize it. But uh, for every shot where the character is seen to speak, it was necessary, as we said, to shoot three different versions and to post-sync all three of them in the three languages in the post-production in Berlin. Now, uh, <laughs> I've always loved that moment when he reaches into his uh, svelte jacket um, and pulls out a, a large bulky package containing a book, uh, the book that's going to take over the, uh, the, the caption narrative function of the film because from now on there'll be no more uh, editorial captions, as it were, telling us who these people are and what they're feeling, but instead there will be pages from this volume on vampire lore, which some people allege was, is a, a real book, um, 
and uh, they'll be there to inform us about vampires and tell us stage by stage what we need to know to make sense of the following action. Interesting to note in passing, by the way, the sheer eccentricity of starting that close-up on the publisher's name at the bottom of the page. The publisher, incidentally, is Gottlieb Faust, a very resonant name. Gottlieb means God's love, and Faust, of course, is Faust. So uh, th this alleged publisher in Leipzig, real or not, um, is given a certain uh, moment in the sun there. Um, but anyway, the, the, the interesting thing is the pan up from this name to the title of the book, where almost every other director would have done it the other way around if they felt the need to show the publisher's name at all. But for Dreyer, it's part of a little pattern because, of course, he, he pans up the title page and then pans down the first page of text. So it forms a little counter movement. Uh, and movement is, as we've already seen, one of the things this film is about. For example, here's a character, the nurse, the, who exits one side of the frame and re-enters on the other side of the frame. Uh, we may infer that she has walked around behind the camera to do this, um, which may be a way of drawing attention to the camera. But I think it's... Uh, I don't think Dreyer wants us to think about the camera when we're watching this scene. He just wants us to be slightly disconcerted by the way these characters move. Here he wants us to notice that the bed is suddenly empty. Uh, and this is an important thing because uh, it's the first of two disappearances. The, the other sister is going to disappear later in the film, uh, but the shot that explains her, or, or not explains, but demonstrates her disappearance uh, is going to be a little less emphatic than that one of the empty bed. Now, the, the, the text, uh, not this text page, but the last one that we saw, uh, introduced us to the notion of the vampire's inhuman strength or unearthly strength. I'm not exactly sure how the subtitles are going to translate it in, in this particular disc. Um, and we're about to see uh, the vampire's strength because we're about to see uh, this elderly, menacing figure in action for the first time. Um, when I say in action, I mean about her business as a vampire. Um, we have, of course, seen her um, at home, as it were, before. Um, uh, interesting to note in passing that in Dreyer's published script, uh, which the film on the whole follows very closely, in, in particular nearly all the dialogue, the minimal dialogue that's in the film, was already present in the script. And so on those occasions when I've had trouble making out the German dialogue, I've referred to the script and almost always the script has answered my questions about what, what, what people were saying at, at different points in the film. Um, However, in the script, the elderly vampire, Marguerite Chopin, is referred to as the blind woman. And uh, she was seen at the stage of writing the film, anyway, as a blind person. Now, she certainly does carry a stick, uh, walks with a stick. But I think there's no, uh, as far as I can discern, there is no implication in the film that she actually is blind. I, I, so I think maybe this concept changed with the casting. The woman was found, I believe she was the mother of an actress. She's another non-professional in a cast made up largely of non-professionals, chosen for their looks or for their essences, for their presences, um, in dry as usual fashion. Um, and the fact that she, in reality, is not blind and perhaps didn't want to play blind may have affected the, the, the choice. But in any case, it's interesting that, that uh, uh, in a film to do with points of view and to do with uh, questions of subjectivity, that uh, Dreyer, at, at an early stage in the project, uh, thought of making his chief villain a blind person, someone who couldn't physically see and who, in fact, relied on her acolyte, the doctor, to do most of the dirty work that involved seeing action. Now here again, the action is dispersed between different characters, some onlooking, some chasing, some carrying the uh, helpless victim here. Uh, and once again, we notice that these shots are very disjuncted. Uh, there's no smooth, seamless continuity. Uh, what we have here is a backwards track which uh, unexpectedly reveals that uh, uh, Alan Gray and Giselle, the younger sister, are present as well, watching this. Um, it's the reverse of most of the motions that we've seen by the camera so far in the film. There have been a lot of lateral tracks, uh, a lot of panning shots, uh, and a lot of fast tracks forward following the action, and as we've noted already, creating 
uh, or maintaining a sense of great urgency in the action. The retreat here, the backwards track, and it's the first time that Dreyer's used, or Dreyer and Mate have used that particular device in the film, um, does, I think, uh, almost uh, psychologically represent a kind of retreat from the climax that we've just witnessed. Um, the fact that Leon, uh, the elder sister, has come under very direct threat from the vampire, and it's the first, in fact, the only time we see the vampire uh, attempting to vampirize a prey, uh, although being caught in the act, as it were, and forced to run away. Um, we've had some measure of, of this uh, allegedly monstrous strength or satanic force that, that uh, the vampire is, is uh, credited with, uh, which seems slightly misplaced in the sense that uh, this is no superwoman vampire. She's not uh, leaping and bounding around the place. She's uh, very much reliant on her walking stick and she moves rather slowly. Um, but the focus here is on uh, victimhood uh, and on the, the dire situation of Leon, which we were introduced to right at the beginning with uh, her father's possibly spectral visit to Alan Gray's hotel room. Uh, maybe this is the point to just note that uh, Sibylla Schmitz, who plays Leon, uh, is one of the very few professional actors in this movie. and uh, She wasn't very professional. She was only, I think, 22 years old at the time. Um, and she had appeared in a small part in Pabst's film, uh, Diary of a Lost Girl, uh, which was, of course, uh, a film starring Louise Brooks, uh, his second film starring Louise Brooks. Um, so she was undoubtedly somewhat overshadowed there. Um, how she came to work with uh, Dreyer is not entirely clear. Nobody has explained this, but in any case, she did, and she dubbed herself, so it's her voice we hear as well. Um, her career was not so distinguished after this. However, um, she has won her place in film history, partly through her appearance in this film, in which she does play one of the leading roles and does it very well, I think, um, but also because she, in later life, became the prototype for Fassbinder's character, Veronica Voss. She is the actress who later became morphine addicted and uh, uh, highly dependent on uh, um, her pushers, her suppliers, and who provided the prototype for um, Fassbinder's Veronica Voss. Uh, this undoubtedly, the, the, this scene is undoubtedly why Dreyer cast a professional actress, uh, because this is asking something that would perhaps be a bit too much for a, a non-professional actor to master. She has to suddenly uncover her demonic side and do it entirely through expressions and uh, uh, physical gestures with her, her face. I think she does it very creditably. Uh, and she succeeds in becoming very menacing without resorting to any melodramatic extreme. Now, in terms of uh, the overall dramatic structure of the film, uh, we've obviously hit a trough at this point because we've had a climax, we've had the first vampire attack. In fact, what's going to turn out to be in fact, the only vampire attack in the movie, since Dry isn't really very interested in such things. Um, and we have a moment of quiet, a, a kind of dramatic hiatus. And uh, it's almost like a Mike Lee film in a sense in that people are passing cups of tea. It's, uh, it's uh, um, uh, the, the archetypal symbol of, of nothing much happening and let's help ourselves to get over this, this little crisis in our lives. Um, however, quiet is not to be uh, maintained for long because uh, the younger sister, Giselle, uh, keeps hearing noises off, or at least thinking she's hearing noises off, um, which reflects both the fact that the dryer has provided a large number of inexplicable and strange noises off. Um, the only one that's been rationalized so far was the glimpse of the cockatoo in a cage, which explains some uh, bizarre noises that we heard earlier in the ice factory scenes. Um, but there are quite a lot of others which are not as rationally explicable. Uh, anyhow, whether there was a noise off or not, and I have to say I didn't hear one myself, but Giselle thought she did, uh, it indicates that, that uh, calm has far from returned to this family and, and this domestic situation, of course, in which the patriarch has just died, so uh, it's not to be expected. 
that uh, things would go back to normal quite so quickly. Uh, and in fact, things become even more disturbing uh, with this scene of the return of the coachman, who unfortunately seems to have met some kind of unhappy accident uh, during his uh, attempt to fetch the police. Uh, Dreyer is actually quoted in, in some interviews or texts of the 1930s as priding himself on the fact that there was no blood in the movie, that uh, he didn't resort to those cliches that one found in Hollywood movies of splashing blood everywhere. Um, that's somewhat contradicted by this scene where the, the coachman, the, the late coachman, who has evidently failed to fetch the police, is indeed bleeding rather profusely and leaving a little puddle of his blood underneath uh, the point where the coach is parked. Uh, he's also lost his hat. Um, I'm only drawing attention to these things because he, uh, his corpse, the coach, and uh, the abandoned hat are going to function as cutaways over the following shots, the, the following sequences. Um, that's, uh, I think, Dreyer's way of maintaining a pattern that has now become pretty much institutionalized in this film of the cutaway. And as we noted, it, it appeared right at the very beginning of the film. And one of the ways that he adds dynamism to the action is through use of these cutaways. Uh, it reminds us, perhaps, that one of the things that, that motivated Dreyer to turned to filmmaking in the first place after his period as a journalist and uh, a court reporter and uh, um, he did all kinds of things for local newspapers in Denmark, uh, was seeing D.W. Griffith's films, and in particular Intolerance, and of course his own second feature, Leaves from Satan's Book, uh, had a certain Griffith-like element to it in the sense that it, it juxtaposed four different stories, although it told them sequentially rather than in parallel with each other, as Griffith had done in, in Intolerance. Um, here, I think, the, this incessant cross-cutting um, between actually disparate realities, there's, nothing, there's no connection between the abandoned coachman's hat lying on the, uh, the gravel of the driveway outside the chateau or the horse being led back to the stable, uh, no longer with its master, and what's going on inside the house. But uh, the, uh, it maintains a pattern of cutting between disparate realities that, as we've noted, has started from the very beginning of the film and is maintained pretty much all the way through it. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a, a kind of anti-Griffithian cross-cutting, we could call it. Let, let's not get too film theoretical about this, but um, this is cutting that has no rational explanation. These shots are not commenting on each other. They don't materially implicate each other in any conceptual way at all. They simply uh, add a certain rhythm and a certain tone to the film as a whole. And that's why he does it, I think. Uh, the same, uh, this is in perfect sync with the film's eccentric and often very dynamic camera movements, these pans backwards and forwards across the room, uh, the, the way that uh, the camera anticipates the arrival of a character in one shot by panning to a door as it's about to be opened, the way that sometimes the camera pans to reveal an absence, a space, uh, where you might expect someone to be, but in fact there is no one. Uh, these have, again, as we noted at the very beginning of our commentary, um, a kind of function in building an atmosphere, building a tone, building a rhythm that is intended to be disquieting. Uh, and this, I think, is Dreyer's way uh, of playing the genre. And it hardly needs to be noted that this is the exact antithesis of the standard melodramatic ploys that are used in conventional horror movies by the likes of Universal Studios. And they were also, need it be said, noted uh, are used by um, Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau, who made probably uh, the most famous version of a vampire myth before this one in Nosferatu. Um, Nicholas de Gunsberg, the producer, lead actor of the film, um, in an interview that he gave in 1964, uh, explains how he and Dreyer, having decided to work together and to make a, a fantastic film, explored all kinds of literary options. And he says that one of the ones that they looked at was Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, which was unofficially adapted by Murnau for Nosferatu. 
um, and it was one that they rejected. Uh, and Gunzberg notes in passing to his interviewers, the Weinbergs, that um, he had seen Nosferatu and personally didn't like it, and he was not interested in producing a film like that. Uh, well, whatever one thinks of the merits of, of Murnau's film, it's certainly extremely different from Vampire, uh, in that Murnau um, establishes a certain mythology and sticks to it uh, in a more or less conventional melodramatic way. The distinction of the film, I think, is in its mise-en-scene, not in its plotting. Um, that couldn't be said of Dreyer's film, which is unconventional from the roots up, if you like. Uh, every single element here is, is uh, surprising, unexpected, and uh, although there is a book informing us about bits and pieces of vampire lore, providing information that we need to make sense of following sequences, uh, particularly to do with the demise of the vampire, how to get rid of a vampire, how to slay a vampire, um, the... Uh, overall strategy is not to explain, not to um, cohere into orthodox dramatic patterns, but to consistently surprise, subvert, and undermine the audience's expectations. And it's done at, at, a, at an almost uh, um, microcosmic level through the very articulation of the shots, the way that one shot fails to match the next, the way that a camera movement fails to complete itself elegantly and, and uh, in, instead reverses itself unexpectedly. All of these things are designed to be disquieting. And that's what I mean when I say that this is an example of, of Dreyer playing the genre, um, doing so in a committedly unconventional way. Some might see it as being critical of the genre, and in fact, some critics like Noel Birch have, have read the film as being uh, implicitly an attack on conventional film syntax. Um, I don't think the Dreyer actually intended it that way. Uh, he wasn't as mean-spirited as that, I don't think. But he certainly did want to do something different from the norm, and he did want to challenge the audience in ways that they were not expecting and which were not being practiced by other filmmakers at the time. Uh, maybe this is the moment to say a little bit about the casting of the Doctor, who is, uh, after all, the uh, the most active villain in the film. I mean, the the, the film, as, as you know, if you've seen it already, ends with his demise, and uh, so he's he's in a in a sense the most uh, threatening of the various antagonists, since he certainly seems to be more active and uh, more immediately dangerous than the vampire, um, since he's the one who circulates in ordinary human company and does malicious and evil things. Uh, there's a very interesting anecdote in uh, Jean and Dale Drum's book, My Only Great Passion, one of the most interesting books about Dreyer, uh, recounted by Ralph Holm, who was the film's assistant director. Uh, he'd been sent out by Dreyer to look for cast, and uh, he came upon what he thought would be an ideal person to play the Doctor on a late-night uh, metro train in Paris, and uh, approached this man and uh, asked him if he'd like to consider acting in a movie, because he looked sufficiently disheveled and... and uh, uh, potentially evil, uh, the man said nothing and uh, uh, um, shuffled off, basically. But uh, the director, the assistant director, Mr. Holm, managed to press uh, a name card into his hand uh, before he went and said, please call me if you change your mind. Um, well, the man did contact them and uh, did suggest a meeting. Um, he went to... Um, uh, a very elegant occasion at the Sorbonne um, to try and effect this meeting as, as, as summoned, only to discover to his great surprise that uh, Jan Hieronimko, um, uh, a man of more Polish extraction evidently, uh, was present at the Sorbonne as a lecturer. He was in fact a distinguished poet uh, and uh, was standing there surrounded by admirers and uh, festooned with decorations and honors. Um, so this man, anyway, finally did uh, uh, reach an agreement with Dreyer and did agree to act in the film. Again, it was, as far as we know, his first and only acting role. Now, because Alan Gray is otherwise engaged upstairs, um, giving blood and, and suffering certain consequences from that, 
um, the function of reading the book and, and informing oneself about vampire law and, and how to deal with vampires has been taken over from him by the elderly servant of the house, uh, who turns out to, be, who becomes in the coming sequences, the agent of destruction of the vampire. He's informing himself how to slay vampires. This, needless to say, is, is uh, more than uh, seven tenths of a century before Joss Whedon and Buffy. Uh, the modus operandi for slaying a vampire hasn't changed all that much. It's that uh, you still stake him through the heart, and, and that does for them. Um, and so he reading here that the, the village he happens to live in is, uh, he discovers apparently for the first time, home to a, a rumored vampire and a particularly dangerous one, somebody who was a monster in real life and a, perhaps a, uh, very possibly is still a monster um, after her supposed demise, uh, decides to take matters into his own hand and take some action to uh, salvage the situation. Meanwhile, in terms of uh, subjectivity again, uh, Alan Gray upstairs is uh, discovering that if you give some of your blood and you provide it to somebody else, uh, certain consequences follow. And when he uh, hears things happening or senses things happening, uh, whether it's just doors opening and closing or shadows passing, um, it has something to do with the fact that, uh, well, as Dreyer puts it in the screenplay, his blood is speaking to him from the other room. Um, this is a point underlined by the doctor who, when uh, Alan Gray complained that his wound was bleeding from where he had let blood, uh, the doctor shouted back, no, no, your blood is in here, don't worry about it. Now, once again, there's some play with uh, levels here. Um, the doctor, we thought, was already upstairs, um, but he seems to be once again going upstairs. Uh, there are narrative uncertainties, and these very much, very much to do with the, the way the film refuses to let you construct space in the conventional way. You're never quite sure where you are in this house. And as we noted earlier, uh, it would be very, very difficult to find your way around the location if you found yourself there based on what you see in the film. Now, uh, back to consciousness questions. Uh, Alan Gray has had the beginning of a dream, um, a very ominous dream. This is where his blood did indeed speak to him and alerted him to the fact that... Uh, something sinister was going on in the bedroom. That something sinister has been clarified by the texts from the vampire book, uh, that uh, if the vampire doesn't succeed in destroying uh, his or her victim, the victim may be induced to suicide, which will have the same beneficial effect on the vampire. Uh, and this is indeed is the strategy that's been decided on here. And so poison has been supplied by Marguerite Chopin to the doctor, who in turn has supplied it to uh, Leon. Now, um, the doctor's hasty getaway here, um, we, we discover in a moment that he has paused on his way out downstairs uh, to pick up Giselle and carry her off with him. Um, but this is not, uh, well, we, we noted earlier when there was the shot of the empty bed when Leon was somehow lured outside uh, to become prey to Marguerite Chopin. Uh, there was a shot of empty bed that uh, expressed that uh, absence. Here, this pan around the empty room expresses Giselle's absence, but it's a much less emphatic expression, it seems to me. First time I saw the film, it wasn't clear to me that what happened here was that Giselle had, had gone. Um, and this is one of many disconcerting things in the film that, that I think uh, probably explains the fact that the film had such a rough reaction when it premiered in Berlin back in 1932 quite a lot of the time people probably didn't really fully understand what was going on strictly in narrative terms. Uh, in that sense, the film could be seen as some kind of precursor, admittedly uh, many decades earlier, of a film or a television series like David Lynch's okay. Twin Peaks. Now, we, I think everybody watching the film can sense that it's approaching its climax now uh, because events have taken a decisive turn uh, and uh, two women are now in threat. One is, is, is uh, apparently dying in her bed and being driven to suicide um, while the other has apparently been kidnapped or 
hijacked or taken off somewhere. Uh, we have an elderly servant who is beginning to decide to take matters into his own hands to try and rectify the situation. And we have a dashing young hero who is dashing through the countryside trying to rescue the younger sister. Um, so all these things are being cross-cut, um, again, without uh, direct relevance to each other. It's just that uh, these are parallel actions. Uh, however, what Dreyer is going to do now is going to take the whole subjectivity issue in the film to another level. Um, in the script uh, at this point, he had Alan Gray happening upon um, a token, some, uh, actually a ring, I thought it was a locket when I saw it, which was the thing that her father gave to her in his dying moments as he lay on the floor uh, expiring. He handed something from inside his jacket to Giselle and it was uh, a keepsake of some kind. Uh, apparently a ring, according to the script. And at this moment in the in the script, Alan Gray would find that ring uh, on the path across the field and be thereby reassured that he was on the right trail in following Giselle, wherever she'd been carried off to. Uh, that detail has been dropped. In fact, there's no further mention of that uh, object, whatever it is that Dad passed to daughter in his dying moments. Uh, so it's one of the small threads that was abandoned in the film, although it may have been something that was, was treated in one of the sequences cut by Dreyer after the, uh, the Berlin premiere. Um, however, uh, as we said, uh, what's happening here now is that uh, the whole question of subjectivity has been taken to a third level because a third Alan Gray has been introduced. Uh, the primary Alan Gray, we can call him that, has sat down on a bench in the field uh, to recover from his tumble. Uh, there he has perhaps fallen asleep and uh, has uh, his dream self has animated itself and wandered off to continue the quest. Uh, the quest has led him to a very disconcerting sight, which is that of himself, a third self, in a coffin. Um, uh, a coffin, furthermore, uh, marked door, but we could even say with the, the, the biblical epithet, from dust are ye made and to dust ye shall return. Uh, it also leads to the discovery of where Giselle has been kidnapped and where she's been tied up. Now, um, whatever uh, the reality of Alan Gray's dream, uh, it seems to have no bearing on the actions of the elderly servant, who, as we've said, has informed himself, thanks to reading the book, of how to slay a vampire, and is going about the process of doing so. He's aware, also alerted by the book, that the village may have its own uh, fiendish vampire in its bosom, specifically in its churchyard, and is going to take matters into his own hand to rid the village once and for all of the threat. Uh, that is not part of Alan Gray's dream. Uh, that seems to have uh, an undeniable independent uh, existence, uh, that strand of plot. Uh, however, the two are juxtaposed here in a way that, that uh, well, um, offers a certain challenge to the audience's sense of who's what and what level of reality are we inhabiting here. We may also note that we're back in a location apparently above the ice factory where the shadows danced uh, because Alan Gray is now retreating back down the trapdoor that he emerged from in the first place and discovered the coffin that the doctor apparently sleeps in. Now, how is Dreyer going to resolve the fact that he has split his protagonist into three at this point, um, which does seem to, at the very least, disperse consciousness ac across uh, several dimensions of the story, and, as we've noted, further complicating matters by cutting away to other action that seems to be unrelated to this particular dream voyage or dream quest. Um, well, he does it in the most unexpected way. Um, first, he introduces elements of... of uh, comedy would be putting it too strongly, but, but uh, the weird... Uh, relationship between the doctor, the sinister doctor, and his underlings, his uh, assistants, the men who have to 
um, prepare the coffin and screw it down uh, is a, a, a yet another change in tone, another change in emphasis in the film, which is which is quite disconcerting, uh, coupled with the the Poe-like motif of um, living burial. Um, at the same time, you've noted that as the coffin was lowered onto the coffin and before the uh, screws were uh, drilled in to seal it, uh, we had the first unequivocally subjective shot in the entire film, and it proves to be the first of a series. This is the second, as the, um, the drill bits turn and the, the screws are, are secured in place and as successive people peer down through the glass at the, the corpse who may or may not be living, uh, including, of course, Marguerite Chopin herself, uh, in, in a shot that, that seems to give the lie to any suggestion that she's, in fact, blind. Well, uh, the interest of this is, is not only that we are uh, being given by Dreyer for the first time in the film these unequivocally subjective shots, but also that what goes with them is a series of tightly cemented and closely edited shots that do offer conventional narrative continuity in a way that the rest of the film has not. Now, at the very moment that we are invited to uh, share um, Alan Gray's point of view, uh, at the moment of his uh, greatest doubt and pain, you could say, uh, is also the moment when the narrative most completely coheres around him and when his subjective perception is matched by a new orthodoxy in the film language. Suddenly the shots do edit together. Suddenly there is direct continuity. Suddenly the angles match. Suddenly there are no more disjunctions. There are no more anomalous cutaways. Uh, and as we live out the nightmare, of uh, the risk of being buried while still conscious, uh, we see unexpectedly, I mean, th these are unusual angles. Whoever gets to look through the window in the front of a coffin uh, at the passing landscape as you move from indoors to outdoors towards the churchyard, which will be your final resting place. Now, as we noted, these are ideas that had been uh, mooted in literature by Edgar Allan Poe in the 19th century. But uh, I think Dry was the first filmmaker to uh, uh, reify them with images like these. Uh, this was a, uh, a strand of imagery that I think was without precedent in film. Uh, plenty of subjective shots in films earlier than this, but uh, especially in this bizarre context, um, this is a, a very striking visual approach which, which cements the film's singularity and uh, helps to explain one reason why it's, it's still thought of as such a seminal film. Arriving in the churchyard in a dream, uh, a very sinister, macabre dream, uh, leads us to uh, back to the film's other level of reality, in which uh, the coffin can, or the pallbearers and the coffin itself can, can vanish along with the dream. Alan Gray can return to his uh, corporeal self. Uh, and we go back to the other strand, the, the, uh, uh, what we might now call the objective reality strand uh, of the elderly servant who has decided to uh, put theory into practice and stake the heart of the late Marguerite Chopin to bring an end to all this torture, suffering and misery in the community, uh, particularly, of course, in the chateau. Um, Alan Gray, once again, as he was at the beginning of the film, is cast as a voyeur, but he's a voyeur this time who becomes an active participant. In fact, he was an even more an active participant in the uncensored version of the film before the German censors had a go at it. Um, in the film as widely seen, uh, which is the, uh, in, in print, derived from the censored German version, two uh, climaxes from this final reel of the movie were shortened. They were reduced of their close-ups, um, or divested of their close-ups, I should say. Um, um, both of these sequences have survived in the French language print, although there are some sound issues about that footage. Um, and 
uh, well, that you can find them on this disc, hopefully reintegrated into the film itself, um, but uh, if not, then as extras after the film. Uh, they reveal in this particular case that uh, Alan Gray not only helps the elderly servant to deal with the, the uh, long-standing menace of Marguerite Chopin, now that she's been revealed as the, the, the source of the village's evil, uh, but also that he's, in fact, the one who hammers the stake while the servant uh, averts his gaze from this uh, alarming spectacle. So he, he moves very quickly in this case from being the voyeur, which was the role we saw him in at the beginning, the fantasist, to being uh, the active agent, the one who actually does the hammering, if you like. And he does it in close-ups. It's a very powerful sequence. We don't, of course, see uh, blood, gore, and splatter in the modern fashion, but we do see, uh, we, we hear in this censored version the sound of the, the stake being hammered in, and we do see uh, the vampire's body uh, metamorphosing into the skeletal remains that they should have been in the first place. Uh, this kind of relief from the spell, or release from the spell, uh, felt initially by Leon, uh, has become kind of a cliché of the genre. Um, you know, the, the, the pestilence is ended, suddenly everybody who was subjected to it has been released from thraldom and is, is back to their normal human self. Thanks to the relative sophistication of Sibylla Schmitz's performance, um, she's not released to blissful happiness, but to total exhaustion. This is a woman, after all, who has been at death's door for the last uh, considerable period. So this final shot of her in the film uh, doesn't uh, render her as, as a sort of newly liberated, happy, happy-go-lucky, carefree young woman. She's somebody who is bearing all the marks of, of many months of suffering. Uh, however, we do have the, the happy knowledge that she's uh, on the road to recovery because that which oppresses her has been brought to an end. Now, having... Uh, fragmented his hero into three and then complemented that by offering us the first unequivocally subjective vision of the film, the most coherent uh, subjectivity in the film. Uh, Dreyer returns us to disjunction and, and mismatching with this extraordinary eruption of banjo playing, uh, another dramatic shift in tone and a very unexpected one and a, you could even say a blackly comic one, I guess. Uh, it turns out to be the harbinger of this ghostly appearance of the vengeful father, um, suggesting that uh, not so much supernatural agency here, although there may be a supernatural agency in play, as simply uh, the pangs of conscience striking. Uh, we may ask, in terms of the narrative logic of the film, why if Leon has been released from the, uh, the thrall of uh, Marguerite Chopin, the vampire, why have these guys not? Um, surely her demise should have also freed them up. The answer probably would be, in narrative terms, that the, the Doctor is also some kind of vampire. He does, as we've seen suggested earlier, sleep in a coffin, it seems. Uh, or the white peg leg, who has a, a semi-detachable shadow, uh, must also be some kind of supernatural creature. Uh, so maybe they are um, themselves so far on the other side that they uh, um, are unaffected by the demise of, of their uh, dark spiritual leader. Uh, the doctor succeeds in getting away. Pegleg does not. Uh, Pegleg is a noise off and a fall down the stairs off. That leaves us with only one bad guy to be dealt with. And uh, Alan Gray is, of course, the man to do it, um, but not single-handedly. Freeing of Giselle is simply one of the loose ends that needs to be wrapped up, and we may note in passing that it's kind of anomalous that he discovered where she was uh, imprisoned and tied up in a dream, and it's in some kind of reality that he releases her. So uh, once again, the uh, space between a dream reality, real reality, and uh, subjective perception is blurred. 
Meanwhile, the last of the bad guys is trying to get away and has taken refuge alongside the river in the old mill. It's a flour mill, uh, which, which is another of these found locations that Dryad and Mate delight in exploring and making the best of visually. Uh, making the best of in the sense that, uh, not that they're using it for picturesque ends or anything as banal as that, but they're using it to maintain the film's uh, enigmatic thrust um, by producing images that are somewhat uh, disconcerting. The angles are disconcerting, the background detail is disconcerting, the relationship between foreground and midground and background is disconcerting. And in this particular case, it's all trebly disconcerting because some supernatural agency does seem to be in play. What closed the door of the cage on the Doctor? It wasn't the servant. He wasn't there. He sees it. He declines to intervene or to help, um, but uh, he didn't do it. What did do it? Probably whatever did it was whatever also made the wheels turn, start turning, and later makes them stop turning. Um, this is the occasion of the German censor's second cut, uh, the demise of the doctor, um, this is something that I, I always think that Ian Fleming must have seen this, because this, of course, is how Dr. No dies in the novel, although not in uh, Terence Young's film adaptation of the novel. Uh, in, in the case of Dr. No, he's buried alive under a, an endless stream of bat dung, um, and uh, guano, I believe it's called, in, in uh, the West Indies. Uh, here, the doctor is buried under an endless stream of flour, um, However, it's the same, um, and uh, the Berlin censor didn't like it, thought it was too graphic, and in particular insisted on taking out the close-ups of the doctor in his moment of uh, extreme pain as he realizes that there is no escape and that he is going to be suffocated by being buried alive in this stuff. Um, again, the sequence does survive, although there is, again, an issue with the sound, and one hopes it can be restored to the film. Now, uh, the pattern of cross-cutting and disjunction continues because two unrelated events are taking place at the same time. One is that the wheels are turning in the mill, the doctor is being suffocated in the mill, the elderly servant has meanwhile disappeared, and Giselle and Gray have somehow very easily found their way onto a boat to cross the river, but have immediately found themselves lost in fog. Now, the, these actions are unrelated and have no bearing on each other. Neither party is conscious of the other. However, being lost in the fog uh, is, of course, um, in many ways equivalent to being um, suffocated under an unending stream of, of dropping flour. Both of them are visually misty. Both of them are, are images of lostness. Uh, and that poetic comparison between the two images of, of being uh, inundated in white uh, provides Dreyer with the final juxtaposition, the final disjunction that uh, cements his strategy in the film. Uh, the two images of being lost have different outcomes. Um, the Doctor, of course, perishes and uh, it was the close-ups of that that the German censor didn't like. Uh, Giselle and Gray find their way out of the mists and into sunlight. Uh, and something or other makes the wheels in the mill stop turning. I wonder what that could be.